How many of you are visiting from out of town? Raise your hand. Welcome. 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 Um, I want to acknowledge there's a whole group of people in overflow. You guys say, hey, we're all one. There's just some silly walls getting in between us, but we love you. Um, I want to honor you. I, I drove up here this morning at, I don't know, before nine. And I saw a huge group of people standing in line, and kids with backpacks. And it's like a, it's like a camp out. And I, I want to honor you. Um, if you came and you stood in line, I want to honor our staff who juggles so many moving parts um, in a very fun, dynamic, growing family <laughs> that we are. Amen. <laughs> this is how family works. Um, I want to honor you if you brought your children this morning. We, I want to reiterate what Beth said. Jesus said, don't hinder them from coming to me. And so uh, we realize that it can be kind of messy, but if he's cool with it, I'm cool with it. Amen. Um, you know, I got to think about that story when they were children to him. You know, they weren't lined up like perfect little children. They were just children. And he said, don't hinder them. And his disciples were trying to keep it all ordered. He said, nah, let them come. I want to bless them, and we have something to learn from them. So if you have children, keep putting them in environments like this. I promise you it will pay off one day. You may not see it. You may not know what's happening inside their little spirits, but they're tasting. They're tasting the presence of God. And they won't forget it. They won't forget it. And maybe one day they'll be on a hard path or they'll be in a dark place and they'll be reminded of those tastes. So don't grow weary. I know it can be exhausting. It can be tiring. I've been there. Sometimes I still am. But it's worth it. Amen? It really is. You know, God can use the funniest things to bring us to him. I have a friend, I don't, I don't, I don't think he's here today, Jason. He, he didn't grow up in a Christian home. <clears throat> and there was some kid in his high school that he describes as really nerdy who would like pinch him if he said a cuss word. And he, would, and he would always, you know, walk by and nudge him and say, Jesus loves you, or I'm praying for you. And uh, one night, he had, he had had a pretty rough life, and he, my friend was high, and he was staying at a friend's house, and he had an overwhelming urge to go take his own life. And he said he was walking in the middle of the night, headed to to find a way to do, to accomplish that and to another room of the house. And all of a sudden, that nerdy kid who would pinch him and say, Jesus loves you, popped in his head. And he said, okay, God, if you're real, show me. And um, all, his, all the substances that he had taken that night left his body. He was immediately sobered, fell to his face, and gave his life to Jesus and has never not followed him since that night. <laughs> God can use anything, right? To 
put them in his presence. The reason why we switched things up um, is because I want to talk to you about worship. And then I want to give you an opportunity to worship. So I'm going to teach, I'm going to give you some who, what, when, hows of worship. And then we're going to do it. Okay? Are you good with that? So let's, let's pray. Put your hand on your heart. We're so busy, Lord. We need a minute. We need a minute to remember you. So we take a moment to be still and know. We throw off the constructs of doing church, showing up, doing the thing, hearing the message, leaving, and we take a moment to be still before you and remember, you're God, you're God. I ask you, Lord, that you would give us a special grace. To come up higher. To entrust the cares of the world to you. The worries of our hearts. Just before we launch into this, will you take a minute and, and, and hold out your hands and lift up to him the things that you, that concern you. They concern him, but sometimes they get too big. And then we can't see the things that really matter. So lift up those things. We entrust our families to you. We entrust our futures to you. We give you our loved ones. We give you our finances. We give you our bodies. All the things sitting there on the front burners of the stove of our minds, Lord, we offer up to you today. You're a dad who cares for your kids. So we bring you these things, Lord. The decisions we have to make. You're a father who cares for your children. So we bring you our worries, we bring you our weights. We ask you, Holy Spirit, you would renew our minds today. Renew our minds, renew our minds. Church, will you, will you sing with me? We take a moment to remember who God is and who I am. There you go, lifting the load again. Come on, a little louder. Take a moment to remember who God is and who I am. There you go, lifting. Oh, again, a 
again. Take a moment to remember who God is and who I am. There you go, lift him a load. Burdens are falling off, keep singing. Take a moment to remember who God is and who I am. There you go, lift him a load. Do it again. Take a moment to remember who God is and who I am. There you go. Lift in my load again. This is Jesus' delight. The Bible says he delights to carry your burden. Come on, would you give it to him? Would you give it to him? It's not too much trouble. He says, I just hear some of you saying you have a narrative in your mind, but I created this problem. And he says, I know, but you can't get out of it. This is not the gospel of you made your bed, so sleep in it. This is the gospel of a father who cares for you. Release your burdens to him. 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 Take a moment to remember who God is and who I am. There you go, lifting my load. You know, there's, um, when we get environments like this, the Spirit of God deposits seeds. But if our garden is full of weeds before he ever even plants, they're just choked out so fast. So I don't want to waste my time or yours letting him sow seeds that never take root. He cares for you. Every little detail, every hair on your head, every thought before you think it. Do you believe that? He cares for you. He said, take my yoke upon you. It's easy and light. Learn from me. I'm gentle and I'm humble in heart. Sometimes we don't know how much is swirling around in our minds and hearts until we quiet. And then we think, oh my gosh, there's so much. I'm like, I'm thinking about, my mind goes from like, what happened with my daughter yesterday to the Ukraine to my grocery list. (laughs) Maybe that's a woman thing, I don't know, but... There's so much swirling around. And he, his voice trumps everything. His voice trumps everything. It's life. Jesus said we don't live by bread alone, but by every word coming from his mouth. I love his voice so much. I love your voice so much, God. Thank you. When 
when God speaks to you, it, it calls to such a deep place. And it could be the simplest thing. It could be, I love you. But when he says it, <laughs> so I want to talk to you about worship. As a as a mother and as a leader in this house, I want to talk to you about worship because it is the thing that has sustained me, carried me, filled me. And it's not worship, it's the person who is being worshiped. Worship has a object. All of worship has an object. Just like you eat, well, you eat something. <laughs> so if you worship, you're worshiping someone or something. So we can't let worship itself be an idol. That can happen. But the key of knowing how to come to him in all situations, circumstances, contexts, and it, when every emotion that my heart has faced, every thought that my mind has thought, every feeling my body has felt, to take all of that and let it thrust me into worship has changed my life. And, and I, wanna, I wanna share that with you. I also wanna share it with you because it's your identity. You are a worshiper. This house is a worshiping house. We are a royal priesthood. It's who we are. And you are a worshiper. Now, not all of you are worshiping the only one worthy of worship, but you are worshiping with your life. Hear me, I, don't, I hope I don't need to say the obvious things like worship is more than a song. It's more than coming to church. I think we all can agree, yes? Worship is your life. Some of the most painful moments of my life have... Um, found the only thing that can ease them is worship. It's literally the only thing that can touch deep pain, rejection, betrayal, loss. It's like, I don't know what else to do. It, I remember when I was 26, uh, we called off our wedding the day before our wedding. <laughs> Michael called off our wedding the day before our wedding. <clears throat> That's necessary to say because I was in deep pain. It sounds silly from where I sit now because I'm so far from it, so healed of it, but at the time... A jilted bride. Um, it was very painful, and I remember that week uh, there was some there was some conference at a church in Grand Prairie, and I told my girlfriends I need to go, and they said, "Are you sure you want to be there? Like, there's people that know you're going to see people that know." When I mean, it was extremely embarrassing, <laughs> um, but I said, I, I, I need to. I need to be in the presence of the Lord. It's all I, if I don't, I don't know what I'm going to do. If I don't throw myself there, I'm going to throw myself somewhere, and that's scary. Um, 
that pain is small compared to some of the pain that I know is in this room because I know some of your stories. It's also true that he's close to the brokenhearted. He's, it's not, a, not, a, not to be stitched on a pillow, but actually true, he's extra close. He's actually extra close. Did you hear Michael say last week, I could hear this the rest of my life and never grasp the gravity of God who dwells everywhere, desires to dwell somewhere. God who's present, who's omnipresent, becomes specifically present. That has changed my life. When I came into a group of people who thought God was actually real enough to be in our midst, that changed everything. So let me, let me throw a few definitions for you of worship. You want Webster's first? <laughs> the Webster's definition of worship is to honor or show reverence for as a divine being or supernatural power. Let me say it again. To honor or show reverence for a divine being or supernatural power. The word for worship in the Old Testament means to bow or pay homage to someone of a higher rank. I believe when we sing, when we come in here and we give praise and worship, we're saying, you're bigger. You're greater. I give reverence to you because you are higher. I submit my heart, my will, my life to you. In our hearts, we're bowing. In our hearts, we're saying, your will, not mine. In the New Testament, for example, when Jesus, you know, the whole narrative of the woman at the well and he says, the Father is seeking those who would worship in spirit and truth. That word for worship is the word they use when a dog licks his master's hand. You see, there's something about worship that acknowledges your humility and your need. Remember what the woman said? Well, even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the master's table. Worship has no worry about exalting yourself. No problem going low. No, none at all. It's a no-brainer. We define simply when we talk about worship as it relates to our sets and how we do throughout the week at Upper Room, we say worship, oh, does anyone know? Worship is, I'm expecting somewhere, agreeing with who God is. Worship is agreeing with who God is, which to me sums up this. You're bigger, you're greater, you're God. So when we sing to him, we're singing you're my savior, you're my redeemer, you're my shepherd, you're the lion, you're the lamb, you're the great I am, you're the bright and morning star, you're the rose of Sharon, this is who you are. And something happens to us when we see him rightly. I told you that you're a worshiper because you're an image bearer. When God made you, he made you what? In his you cannot help but reflect the image of something or someone because it's how you were made. I want you to, I have this quote from this guy named G.K. Beale. He says, what do you and I reflect? This is from a book called, uh, We Become What We Worship. What do you and I reflect? God has made humans to reflect him. But if they do not commit themselves to him, they will not reflect him, but something else. 
in creation. At the core of our beings, we are imaging creatures. It's not possible to be neutral on this issue. We either reflect the creator or something in creation. You know, if you watch the news all day, you reflect fear. If you hang out on Twitter all day, you probably reflect a, reflect a political spirit. If you hang out on Instagram all day, don't get me started <laughs> on what you are reflecting. I don't know if you can see this precious little one. When the father knit her together in her mother's womb, he put something inside of her heart biblically. It says he put eternity in there. And she's, did y'all dedicate her this morning? Okay, so she is going to grow up in this beautiful family in the ways of the Lord. She's going to learn all these things about the community of God, the house of God. She's going to learn about her father. She's going to learn about the Bible and discipleship and evangelism. But there will be one thing that that little one is going to do for all of eternity. She's not going to disciple anyone in heaven. At least I don't think so. She's going to be a worshiper all her days. And when you and I come into worship, the right kind of worship that's to God, where we actually see him and we agree with who he is, there's this eternal thing. It's like, a, it's like two ends of a magnet. It's like the thing inside of you that's eternal finds, finds again its purpose in the image reflection that's happening. It's like you're, you become tethered again to who you actually are. And you begin to sing like they are in heaven, holy, 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 worthy, 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 holy, holy. And you begin to see him as he is. And it's only in seeing him that you have any clue who you might be. Listen, I was, as I prepared for this, I kept thinking, I could so easily fall into the trap of convincing you to worship by telling you how it's so good for you. But that just feels a little wrong, right? Because worship is not for you. <laughs> it's for him. And ironically, as it is about him, that is when you benefit. In fact, one of the most treasured things about worship is that you lose yourself. When Jesus said, if you want to follow me, you've got to lose your life to gain it. And the thing that happens when we look at him as he is, we forget all the things, and then we find him, and we find life again. We find life again, because eternity is in your heart. And every time you come into the Lord's presence, you get realigned with everything that matters. You are a worshiper. You're worshiping something or someone all the time. Can I show you the first time the word worship is used in the Bible? Go to Genesis chapter 22. I think one of the reasons God was so passionate about us not worshiping idols is because he knew we'd be disappointed. He knew that anything other than himself would be a disappointment, that we would 
worship and worship and worship and idolize and idolize and idolize and then it would always come up short. Look at, this is, this is the narrative where God asked Abraham to sacrifice his promise, Isaac. And this is the first time we see the word worship used. I hope this frames something for you. Genesis 22, verse four. So they went on a three-day journey. Interesting. Then on the third day, Abraham lifted his eyes and saw the place afar off. Stay here with the donkey, he told his, his servant that had come with him. The lad and I, so Isaac and I, will go yonder <laughs> um, and worship. And we will come back to you. Now, were Isaac and Abraham headed up the mountain to sing hallelujah? We give you the highest praise. Nope. He was about to go give his son the most painful thing he could be asked to do. The next place we see the word worship used often is in Exodus. When the Israelites are enslaved and they're crying out and God decides to send a burning bush to speak to Moses. And he says, you're gonna go deliver my people. I'm gonna set them free. And he says to Moses, here will be the sign that I'm sending you. When you leave Egypt, when you leave them out, you're gonna come back to this very mountain that you're here with me on and you're going to worship. And every time Moses, God sent Moses to tell Pharaoh, let my people go, his reasoning was so that they might worship. Not so that I can, so they can do this or that, but let them be free so that they can worship me. He loves that free will offering. He loves to do things for us that provoke us to worship him. In fact, at one point, Pharaoh said, fine, go. Just take the men and go, go worship your God. And Moses said, no. Actually, it needs to be all of us. We have to have our men, our women, our children, our animals. It needs to be the whole family to come and worship. So worship, up until the time of King David, worship in the Old Testament was synonymous with sacrifice. We see some instruments around warfare. We see like, we're going to war, blow the trumpets, ba -ba -da, or we won a battle, ba -ba -da -da, we celebrate, but we don't see worship like you and I think of it. We don't see it like, oh, they, they gathered together and they sang a song to the Lord. We don't see that in the Bible until King David. Now, I still, I've studied this so much, but I, I, it blows my mind how David came up with what he came up with. God didn't tell him to do it, or at least we don't have a record of that. King David decided we're gonna bring the Ark of the Covenant in, and instead of the animals, you guys can do that over there, but instead of sacrificing bulls and goats, we're gonna establish these people with their instruments. And around the clock for 33 years, all they did was give thanks and praise. And here's the miracle. We know as new covenant believers, right, that the, that the shedding of blood of bulls and goats stopped when? It stopped with Christ. He is our once and for all sacrifice. 
And so that idea of worship, with all its regulations, you'd committed this sin, bring this animal. You, you want to make this kind of offering, do it this way. So many regulations for what worship was. They're bringing their offerings. They're bringing their animals. They're bringing, if they came from, from afar, they brought their money so that they could buy the animal to give to sacrifice. And that all ended with this one sacrifice. So I have a question for you. If Jesus fulfilled what the Old Testament called worship by giving his life and shedding his blood, then what is our worship? It's good food for thought, right? What do you actually have to give God? Was he, he gave everything that you could give. He gave everything that you couldn't give. <laughs> Am I right? Ask yourself, what do I actually have to give God? He doesn't need anything. I think about him when he sat across from the treasury and the people were bringing in their tithes and offerings. And there's this precious woman, this widow, and she has her two minds. Did he need them? Answer me. Did he need them? <laughs> but did he find it precious? He found it so precious. Because she gave all that she had. Not because he needed it. Not because he's an egomaniac. But he says, oh, she trusts me. She trusts me. She's acknowledging right now that I'm her provider. She trusts me. Look at her. So what is our worship? He, he paid the price. He offered our worship for us. Truly. Our worship is thank you. <laughs> our worship is thank you. You did it all. Paul says in Romans, therefore, in view of God's mercies, in view of his mercies, in view of his mercy, you present your body as a living sacrifice. Death is no longer required. It's been paid for. But it's in view of his mercy that you say, here I am. Thank you. Here I am. If I, could, if I could simplify worship for you, I would say it's a life bowed to his will that says, thank you. Here's my life. Thank you. Here's my life. Thank you. And you know what's wild about that scripture? Can you put it up there, Romans 12.1? I beseech you. <laughs> Therefore, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service or, same word, worship. In other words, it's the only reasonable response. Here I am. You know what blows my mind? He didn't say, make sure that you are holy and acceptable before you present yourself. He said, here, I'll make you holy and acceptable 
And all you have to do is present yourself. I find that holy and acceptable. All you have to do is present yourself. Can I just go on a rabbit trail for a minute? I feel the Lord. I want to say, if you feel like you hear people talk about the abundant life in Christ, and you're thinking, I haven't yet found that. Can I challenge you with something? It's found in complete surrender. It cannot be accessed one foot in, one foot out. It, 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 you can't find it. Ab- abundant life is found all in. It's not about your works. It's about you can have it all. Here's my body, a living sacrifice. The whole of it, the whole of it, the whole of it, the whole of it. The parts that I think that you might not like, I still give. The parts that I think that you might find undesirable, God, the parts that I'm ashamed of, the history that I have that maybe isn't something I'm proud of, but the whole of it, and that is where true freedom and abundance lies. You know, he said, I, 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 the Father is seeking worshipers who worship in spirit and in truth. What does it mean? It means there's nothing hidden here, God. There's, and, and not, there's already nothing hidden from him. He sees everything. But when you know that he sees everything and you willingly come to him, with that, and you receive what his blood is speaking over the everything. (laughs) Holy and acceptable. One of my favorite quotes is um, by Teresa of Avila, and she says, when you don't know what to do, I don't know if she says that part. That's my ad. She says, look at Christ. She says, look at Christ who is looking at you. (laughs) Could it really be that simple? I think it is. I really do. Look at Christ who's looking at you. I want to... I want to show you two things. First, um, I made a really great graphic for you. (laughs) Isn't that awesome? Here's the crazy thing about worship. I hope by now we've established it has zilch to do with what you're feeling. But what I can help you with is whatever you're feeling can actually catapult you, good, bad, or ugly, into praise and worship. So here's what happens. Remember, this is your eternal identity. So as you step into your eternal identity as a worshiper, you begin to praise and worship. Remember, the right kind that causes you to actually see him. Agree with who he is, your king, your lord, you're a good shepherd, you're a faithful leader, you are faithful and true, you're a good father. You begin to see him as he is, and the more that you see him, the more that you want to worship him. And the more that you worship him, the more that you see him. And the more that you see him, the more you want to worship him. And let me tell you, a a, a precious afterthought. You're not even going to care anymore. But somehow in the mystery of that cycle, you begin to see yourself rightly. Because when you died and you, were, you came to Christ, you were seated in him. There is no finding you outside of finding him. Please don't go look for yourself and identify with every every. Ah, I don't, I don't want to, I don't need to, mm-mm. But you find him. You find you. But you don't 
by the time you find you, you don't care anymore because you found him. And you don't care anymore because you found him. And he's so wonderful. And then you become this creature that you were created to be who's without fear, who's fully free, who feels so loved and secure. If you're insecure, worship. If you deal with comparison, worship. It will set you free. And you say, well, how long? Forever. <laughs> Just keep doing it. Did you know that I could be wrong and J. Lou can correct me. He knows much more than I do in this topic. But the first time I can find that we see Jesus like worshiping the way you and I think of it <clears throat> is right after the Passover, the, the Last Supper. He's washed their feet. He's... I'm not saying he didn't sing before that. I'm sure he did. I, I think he's a singing God. But he washed their feet. He identified his betrayer. And he's headed to give his life. And it says, right before they leave the upper room to go into the, garden, the, the Mount of Olives, it says, and they sing a hymn. And I think, man, what an offering that must have been. When he knew what he was about to go do, when he knew all these ones that he just washed their feet wet, they were about to all leave him and reject him, and they sang a hymn together. I wonder what they sang. Rabbi Jason probably knows. Uh, you know, Paul and Silas sang in a prison. They sang hymns, and the whole prison heard them. Can I tell you, if you're in a dark spot, of betrayal or rejection or confinement or persecution, worship is your key. So let me take a couple minutes. I could talk for weeks on this. But let me take a couple minutes and unpack some of the intricacies of our worship as it relates to our ministering to the Lord in song. Part of what we do here, part of what we came in and did this morning is praise and thanks. We know biblically we enter his courts with thanks. We enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. But I hope, I hope that you will begin to venture in and realize that it's, that's just an entry. Like, I would never want you to come in here and just hang out at the door. Or if you came to my house, I would never want you to stand in the entryway. I want you to come in and dine with me. Sit with me in my kitchen. Let's talk. Let's hang out. And if you're Michael, let's we go to our room. Like we, you, I hope you don't just stay at the gates. Something comes upon us when we praise and we give thanks and we're seeing him as he is. And when you see him as he is, you can't help but enter into worship. Worship is a place where you become the offering, the living sacrifice. It's where you, and, 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 and it's this mysterious co-laboring of the spirit of God in our midst and our will saying, yes, I will give myself fully to God over and over and over and over again. Uh, one of my, one of the books I really enjoy on worship is called Glory. It's by a lady named Ruth Ward Heflin. I highly recommend it. Um, but she has this 
analogy about the difference between praise and worship that I, I wanted to read to you. I think it's beautiful. Can you put that quote up? <clears throat> she says, I see the difference between praising and worship as if I were part of the Palm Sunday procession. I join others as we take our coats off and exuberantly throw them down so the Lord can ride over them. We pluck off palm branches and wave them, even strewing them in his pathway. We shout with the whole crowd, Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. That is praise. I suddenly spot a little donkey moving along the Palm Sunday route. It continues on its way until it passes directly in front of me. It stops. Jesus, King of kings and Lord of lords, is seated on that donkey. He looks at me, he says, Ruth, I love you. And tears stream down my cheeks as I reply, Lord, I love you. Now I'm no longer waving my palm and shouting, Hosanna. I'm bowing in worship and saying, my Lord, and my God, it seems that the crowd is no longer present. In reality, the multitude is still there all around me. Others are still waving their palms. They're still shouting Hosanna. But I'm totally oblivious to what is happening around me. He looks at me. And all the love of eternity is poured into my soul. At this moment, I know how much he loves me. I know his majesty in a way I've never known it before, nobody has to tell me. He is king. I know it, and I worship him, bowing before him, recognizing his majesty, his regal position. Are you beginning to see it? You see, we have a corporate calling, but you have an individual invitation. I cannot worship for you. I cannot worship for you. I don't have your story, your voice, your hands, your heart. You are literally the only one who can give God what you can give God. Will you guys come up, worship team? you so much and he he loves you so much and I feel his heart is grieved when we put barriers there that he, he died to remove he took care of every problem between you and him and he really wants to be trusted. That there is no barrier between you and him on his end. He's completely exposed and available. And he longs for that sweet place of communion with you. Yes, with us, but with you. Will you stand up? have communion in your seats. I 
I like to imagine that um, I have like a fire pit in front of me. And whatever is going on in my life, the happy stuff, the successes, the pain, the failure, the questions, the mundane, the places where I feel like I just, I'm not good at that. <laughs> I like to imagine all of them like logs for my fire pit. All of it, all the stuff, all my relationships, everything I have, I just imagine throwing it in. Because he loves all of it, right? He loves all of it. And so even as I worship and a thought might come in my mind about whatever, some, something sad, something difficult, something that feels like a failure and I just throw it in the pit in front of me, say, let it be worship. Let it be an offering. So hold up the body. Jesus, we feast on you. You are life to us, your bread. <laughs> you are life to us, literal life. We feast on you. How good you taste. <laughs> we feast on you. And you said when you eat this meal, remember me. So would you just whisper straight to him, say, I remember you, Jesus. I remember that moment when I first felt your love, when I first heard of you. I remember, I remember, I remember, I remember you. I remember you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. This is a meal of thanksgiving. It's called the Eucharisto. It's to give thanks. So lift it up and say, thank you. Thank you. We declare, Lord, it's enough for us. Can you tell him? It's enough for me, it's enough for me. Yeah, take the body. Hold up your blood, his blood. I'm gonna read Hebrews to you real quick. Hebrews 13, verse 11. For the bodies of those animals whose blood is brought into the sanctuary by the high priest for sin, they're burned outside the camp. Therefore, Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered outside the gate. Therefore, let us go forth to him outside the camp bearing his reproach for here we have no continuing city but we seek the one to come therefore by him say by him let us continually offer the sacrifice of praise to god that is the fruit of our lips giving thanks to his name you can take the blood Let's worship. Let him see your face. Let him hear your voice.
this carpet's open up here. You're welcome to it. My carpet is your carpet. Spirit of wisdom, open my eyes again. Spirit of revelation, open my heart again. Spirit of wisdom, open my eyes again. Spirit of revelation, open my heart. Sing that again. Spirit of wisdom, open my eyes again. Spirit of revelation, open my heart again. Spirit of wisdom, open my eyes again. Spirit of revelation, open Cause I want to see
your head is white as wool, and I know that your voice sounds like wild. Jesus, you're beautiful, and I know that your eyes are like a flame of fire. I know that your head is white as wool, and I know that your voice sounds like wild. Jesus, you're beautiful.
going to get your kids. Bless you to do that. I, I just asked Nick to lead us in a song in his native tongue because there's something really special about it. So if you want to join in, and, um, just as we do that, if our altar team wants to come up, we'd love to pray for you. If there's anything that you need prayer for, encouragement, please. Your faithfulness is great. Your faithfulness is great. Your faithfulness, it's incomparable. There's no one like you. There's no one like you, God. Great is your faithfulness. Receive prayer. We love you. 